A couple of weeks ago, I was out on my regular morning bike ride. I was going through a neighborhood a few miles from my home, and I saw up ahead that there was a large dog just walking down the sidewalk. At 8 o'clock in the morning, this is not really that unusual. Some people walk their dogs every morning. What was unusual was that there were no people around. It was just this big black lab, and he seemed to be just out for a walk on his own. Well, I'm a real animal lover, and that especially applies to dogs, so I couldn't just keep riding and ignore this. So I parked my bike and sort of cautiously watched the dog to see if it was friendly or not so friendly. And the great thing about dogs is their tail. That tail is a great indicator of their mood. And this dog, when he saw me, just started wagging that tail and came right over to me. So I was talking to him and I checked his collar and sure enough, there was a tag with the dog's name, Jackson, and a phone number. So I held onto his collar with one hand, and I dialed the number on my phone with the other hand. A lady answered, and I just said, Hi, do you have a dog named Jackson? Well, she paused for a second, and she said, No, but my son does. I'm actually in Colorado. So it turns out that Jackson used to be her dog. Then when they moved to Colorado, Jackson stayed here in Florida with her son. And he just never changed the phone number on the tag. So the lady called her son, and he came out from a few doors down and got Jackson back home. He actually wasn't even aware that Jackson had somehow gotten loose. The point of that story is, I was okay with cautiously approaching this 80-pound dog, because in my experience, most dogs are friendly. But what if, instead of riding my bike through a neighborhood and seeing a dog... I was instead hiking on a trail in Alaska and crossed paths with a bear. Of course, I would have had a totally different reaction. I would not have tried to go near the bear. And in most cases, the bear would not want to come near me either. That's just how those encounters usually go. My guest today is Dan. He lives in Alaska and he loves the outdoors. Hiking, camping, fishing, climbing, just about anything you can do outdoors, Dan has done it. And Dan has had encounters with bears from time to time. One time, after the bear scampered away from his campsite, Dan actually followed the bear for a bit just to observe him. But there was one time Dan happened to unexpectedly cross paths with a bear that didn't run away. It was a grizzly bear. And that was a day that Dan will never forget. Real people in unreal situations. There is a man standing in front of me in my bedroom. My friend has been shot. I'm in the literally inside the river and I'm inside my car. He had told me multiple times that he was going to set himself on fire. If you say my name or try to look at me, I'm going to kill you. And he was just sobbing. He said, Mom, Mom, tell me you're going to be okay. And I jumped on the hood of the car and I held on. And I looked into the garage and he was hanging from the rafters. I had somebody standing on my neck. He's better to me dead. I want him dead. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? Back when this happened, would you normally carry like bear spray or, or anything for protection against bears when you'd be outdoors? There are definitely many times where I would carry bear spray. You know, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness doing a whole range of different activities. You know, I fly in to pretty remote areas and get dropped off for, for days on end or do backpacking trips or different hikes. And there's a lot of times and situations where I definitely would carry uh, bear spray. I wasn't carrying bear spray this particular day um, at the Russian River. It's, uh, you know, an area where arguably I should have had bear spray. It's a very popular and crowded area, uh, typically lots of people. And so I definitely had lots of bear encounters there previously, but none that were ever menacing or threatening. It, it was, I think typically bears there are pretty habituated to people in this particular circumstances. I think uh, 
there were some bears that had traveled down from higher in the mountains and elsewhere to look for fish. And so potentially put myself into a pretty dangerous situation without maybe realizing just how bad it was. Before we talk about that day and, and what happened, can you kind of set it up a little bit of what happened even just the day before? Because that's kind of a critical part of the story, right? Yeah, indeed. I had been in Alaska at that point for about a year. And, you know, even so just leading up to that day before, you know, that whole year was really a time in my life where things were coming together really well. You know, I'd sort of found my dream home nestled in the Chugach Mountains uh, there in Alaska. The backcountry skiing uh, was amazing. The fishing was amazing. The, the beauty of, of the land and the ocean right there, just remarkable. I had a great job, you know, kind of working with um, troubled kids, taking them out into the outdoors and, and helping them find healthy, healthy ways of living and coping with trauma in their lives. I had just purchased a cute little cabin nestled up in the, in the Chugach. Uh, wasn't much, you know, like the outhouse didn't even have a door, but I could look out from my outhouse and see all the way to Denali, like 200 miles to the north. So even though it wasn't much, I always joke that my, my outhouse had a million dollar view. <laughs> it was quite something. So my life, you know, kind of up to that point was just coming together really well. And probably one of the best things that I had going for me on that particular day was I'd recently got the attention of a cute uh, blonde from Minnesota named Amber. And we had this sort of one of these spectacular first dates together, if you will, where we I'd asked we'd met up after work and we're driving back from uh, Anchorage down to Girdwood, where we lived, and uh, we're driving along the Cook Inlet, or actually the Turnigan Arm off of the Cook Inlet, and we see a bunch of beluga whales out in in the arm, and so we we kind of pulled off the road and and jumped over the guardrails and scrambled out across Beluga Point to the tip of the point where it meets the water. And we sat there and, and right in front of us, you know, was, was a whole school of beluga whales just rolling in the waves. And um, they were so close that we could hear their breath. And, and we were actually even getting sprayed by the mist as they came up and rolled. It was really remarkable. And it was sort of like when you share the moments like that with somebody, it has a way of of creating chemistry, um, you know, bonds people to, to kind of have those types of shared experiences. Cause this was, it was pretty amazing. And so I jokingly now refer to that chemistry with Amber that happened that first time we kind of hung out as like the beluga chemistry between us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah. So that, that, that day right before uh, the bear mauling though, is kind of, we've been seeing each other around Girdwood for the, the month before that and noticing each other and hanging out from time to time. And the very night before we sort of decided to move our relationship forward and sort of try our, try our hand at a relationship, you know, was, I mean, Facebook wasn't really a thing of our times way back in 2003, you know, but <laughs> had it been, we might've woke up the next morning to change our relationship status. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's, it sort of became official at that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe an unspoken official, sort of. It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, you know, when I was taken off to go fishing, it's sort of this thing where, you know, I thought about asking her if she wanted to come, but I was like, nah, it was pretty intense last night. Let's take it slow type of a thing. And so I just gave her a hug and, you know, we said our goodbyes. And I told her, I said, hey, I'll call you when I get off the river. And uh, of course that point I was unaware that that would be a promise that I would be unable to keep. Wow. So that, that morning at that point where the place where you went fishing that morning, there were lots of bear sightings at that time. What is it that makes a place like that attractive to bears when there's lots of people? I thought they mostly avoided people. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, because definitely typically that's very true. On this particular year, I mean, well, first of all, this is a common area for bears because it's a pretty significant run of fish. Uh, so there's a lot of salmon 
that do run up the Russian River. So there's a couple of different runs of uh, red salmon or sockeye salmon um, and, and a silver salmon run that go up it. So it, it definitely does have a lot of bear activity when the fish are in. But this particular year was significantly worse uh, set up in terms of bear safety, bear activity, because uh, the salmon were significantly late. And so typically, I think a lot of the bears are further up river and, you know, there's plenty of food in the rivers and things like that. But on this year, because the run was so late, I think a lot of bears were coming down to the lower rivers. So there was an unusually large sort of concentration of bears sort of down in the lower part of the river, uh, looking to see if the fish were coming in yet. Well, okay. So your plan was to go fishing that day with some friends. Can just can you just take us through what happened? It started out as a great day, uh, one of these Alaskan summer days uh, where you know bluebird skies and the sun shining and you know just enough breeze to keep the mosquitoes at bay and uh, just warm enough to be in in a t shirt comfortably and. You know, those are those kind of priceless Alaskan summer days when the fish are in and the weather's good. And, you know, those are the type of days that give us all, you know, Alaskans, they, they make us forget about winter. We call it winter amnesia. It happens every summer. <laughs> Keeps us here year after year. We had to fish pretty hard, but, you know, by late in the, the evening, and evening is a relative term since, of course, up here in the summertime, it really doesn't get dark. We did catch all our fish, and so probably around 10.30 or so, we, we were packing up and getting ready to make the 20-minute trek upriver to to where our car was parked at the trailhead. So we, uh, you know, made the walk back up and um, just kind of talking about the day and, and catching up when, and, and I was there with my friend John and my, my dog Maya. And my dog, Maya, uh, just lets out this little growl. And she was, you know, a trail dog. She'd been on probably thousand, over a thousand trail miles with me uh, in her time. And so when she made that noise, I knew that she was alerting me to something. I look up and sure enough, about 30 feet away was a large grizzly. And I've had a lot of bear encounters over the years. And none that were quite like this. I mean, I've I've had some really cool bear encounters where I was able to kind of really watch bears in their natural environment behaving in a number of different ways and, and kind of spend some time watching them. I've More times than not, you know, when I've seen bears, they were bolting. You know, you see their rear end as they either walk or scamper off. This bear, though, was clearly having a pretty bad uh, day. She was a very agitated bear. She turned to face us immediately and was stomping her, you know, her paw and kind of jumping up and down on her, uh, on her front legs, you know, so kind of huffing and growling and her haunches were all raised. We could tell right away that she wasn't messing around. So my friend John and I stood close together, put our hands up in the air to make ourselves look bigger. And we didn't do much at first. We just stood our ground to kind of see how she was going to react and we talked about, you know, what the best thing to do was from here. And we decided the best thing was just to back away slowly and to head further up river, just to clear the area, give her plenty of space. And we were going to go to a different trailhead and kind of loop back around to where our car was parked. Because our car at that time, when we encountered her, was pretty much right behind where she was. I mean, right behind her was a staircase and... At the top of the staircase was essentially our car. But anyway, uh, we were able to back away and um, start heading up river. And we'd gotten just far enough to where we were able to start to really relax. And we started talking about, man, that was kind of a crazy encounter. I, you know, I wonder what was up with that bear type of thing. When all of a sudden in front of us on the trail, the, the alders started shaking vigorously we couldn't see through the alder, you know, it was thick brush, so couldn't see what it was. But whatever was causing them to shake the way they were was, you know, a large animal. So we were pretty confident that we'd been cut off by that same sow. And when you're in bear country, you know, 
that's highly unusual bear behavior and it's not you you know you know it's not good it's not a good situation to find yourself in when you're being followed or you know maybe stalked by uh, a large predator like that especially a grizzly bear and so at that point you know my heart just starts pounding and stomach sort of drops to my toes and we turn around and we start heading back at a brisk pace back towards the uh, the trailhead where our car was parked right back to where we had had the initial encounter with the bear and in no more than probably about 10 15 steps just the totally unimaginable happened and that is that with the shaking brush now behind us directly in front of us the bear came ripping around the corner at missile speed and in just a moment was upon us my dog maya was kind of out in front of our group and then john was in front of me and then i was kind of the closest to the shaking bushes behind us and so in just a flash she was on us my dog maya in the front you know she leaps off the trail to the right and the bear swiped at her but didn't connect and then i see my friend john you know he leaps off the dra- the trail in the other direction and so i turned and took a couple running steps and leaped off into the bushes as well hoping we all you know that she would just continue on her trajectory uh, but unfortunately since i was the closest to the shaking bushes which we wouldn't know until later were her cubs so we weren't even aware that there were cubs in the area but as it turns out her cubs were cached there during that whole initial encounter and we had unknowingly put ourselves into this situation and so as i leap off the trail you know before i'd even hit the ground she had a hold of my leg and was yarding me out of the bushes with her claws i could feel her claws immediately sort of digging into my my leg and in in that moment you know like this is a fully sort of traumatic experience where like reality warps itself and everything is a little surreal Um, you know there's some sort of dissociative types of things happening where you almost feel like you're outside of yourself so i could feel the pain for sure but then i could like hear this screaming and then i sort of had to realize that that was me that was screaming and then after she kind of pulled me out of the bushes she picked me up by my head and and was dragging me across the trail down the trail and then dragging me off into the alders uh, into the forest you know and i could just feel the dirt and the roots and the grass uh, moving by underneath me um, until eventually i just lost consciousness and you know then then i would come to i would i would kind of wake up and the the mauling would be continuing and then i would lose consciousness again and this this sort of happened several times where i would regain consciousness and be very aware that that I, the mauling was continuing um and, and that that whole time i i uh, i was laying on my belly so I was, you know, good that I was face down. I had a backpack on. Yeah, I was sort of holding my hands over the back of my neck to try to protect my my neck and head as much as I could, which was, you know, pretty futile effort to protect myself in, in that moment. Then one of the times I came to consciousness, you know, I, I wasn't getting mauled and it was kind of quiet and I could hear my friend John calling my name from a distance so I called back to him just so that, cause I didn't know how far off the trail I was drug by the bear and, and I definitely wanted him to know where I was, you know, in case he was with rescue. And so I called back to him and unfortunately I think uh, that to the bear, you know, my calling back to, to John was too much sign of life because she re- quickly returned um, after I called back and, and the mauling continued. And the next time that I woke up, something really bad had happened. And that was that she had managed to get me flipped over. So I was now laying on my back, you know, face up. 
and she was essentially standing over me um, with her front paws on either shoulder, her face sort of directly over mine. And, you know, there was just sort of this moment there where I could hear her breathing and hear her like sort of grunt, grunting and, and growling. And, and I'll just never forget, you know, sort of the magnitude uh, and the power of, you know, this bear on top of me and, and the volume of her breath. And, and that's when she cocked her head sideways and bit down across my face from side to side uh, and chewed. And, you know, that's when everything went black. And the next thing that I was aware of was kind of realizing in that moment that all the pain had gone away and terror had gone away. And there was just kind of like this, almost like a peaceful feeling. And I'm kind of trying to figure out what's going on and where I am. And I'm looking around, but there's nothing to see. No shape, no form. It was just this bright blue light, like this iridescent blue light. And I'm trying to figure it all out. And I realized that I was at this crossroads. And that I, I felt like I had a choice to make in that moment, like to live or die. And to me in that moment, like it was clear that all I had to do was make up my mind and let go of life. And, and it was that easy. Like on the other hand, it was clear that I could try to fight to hold on to, to life. And that, you know, maybe, you know, there, it was an unknown uh, whether or not I, I could. It was interesting, the thought process that, that went through my mind at that crossroads, because I remember thinking, like, I don't know what kinds of injuries I will have endured. I don't know what the damages will be, you know, if I can survive. So it was sort of like the hard choice and the easy choice just to let go. And I, I can't really explain why, but all of a sudden in that moment, you know, this image just appears to me and it was like watching a home, a home video or something, but it was an image of my mom and there she was from the waist up and she was just waving to me and smiling, just this happiest I've ever seen her radiant smile. And it was interesting and, and it filled me just to see her, you know, so happy like that and waving like that, you know, it, it, it filled me with this feeling that in a moment like that might be the only feeling that could make life worth fighting for, you know, and that is clearly like that feeling of, of love between a, a parent and a child. And uh, in that moment, I knew what I was going to do. I, I made up my mind that I was going to fight for, for life and that it was worth fighting for. So, I to sort of reconcile the fact that I didn't know how hard it was going to be or, you know, what kinds of challenges there would be. I realized that the worst case scenario would be to look back someday and regret fighting for my life, to regret life itself, just because, you know, I didn't know, you know, how bad things were going to be. And so I, I made a, a deal with myself, like a contract almost like, hey, you know, from this moment forward, it's about one small step forward at a time. And you can never look back. You can never look back and question this decision. So uh, that, that was it. I made up my mind and, and it was interesting because it was like as soon as I made up my mind, then, you know, it was like I was just able to rest there in this place of the blue light and sort of restore and regain some energy there before I needed to go back into my body at the Russian river. And I'll always remember sort of the first seeing myself looking down at my body on the forest floor, laying there in a pool of blood. And then I sort of woke up from within my body. And uh, my first instinct was 
about rescue, self-rescue, self-evacuation. Um, I was a trained wilderness first responder um, due to a lot of backcountry experience and guiding experience. So my first thing is about kind of self-assessment. And very quickly, I realized I was in really bad shape. You know, I basically had no control over any of my limbs. I uh, could feel blood pooling in my waders and filling up my waders. Um, I could feel blood pooling under my head. And I realized like the only, the only chance I had at living was just to stay still and to try not to use any energy and hope that rescue would be there soon. Did you know that the bear was gone by that time or was she gone? I did know, um, you know, and I knew that only by sense there was a quietness and a stillness in the forest. And I, and I just figured, you know, that I probably wouldn't have come back into my body at the time I did if, if the bear was still there, but yeah, it was just a sense I had that she was gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, a little while later, I, I, uh, I hear people and my friend John, uh, had gotten with a few other fishermen and uh, come to find me. As it turns out, my dog Maya uh, actually had helped guide these fishermen back to where they found John and then uh, helped them find where I was. So my dog Maya definitely had a part in kind of that rescue. And uh, John stayed with me then and, you know, started applying pressure to try to stop the bleeding from my head and, and things like that while the other people uh, went to try to go get a cell phone signal uh, so that they could could call for help. Um, so it would be about two and a half hours laying there on the forest floor before the EMTs would arrive. And uh, about five and a half hours or so uh, before the EMTs would have me loaded, uh, loaded into a, a medevac helicopter and uh, flown out for Providence, Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage, Alaska. That's a long time for such serious injuries. It r- truly is. I mean, yeah. So right as they were loading me into the ambulance to take me over to where the uh, helicopter could land on the highway, you know, my, fr- my friend says, hey, hang in there bigly, you know, we'll be out here fishing again before you know it. And uh, yeah, you're speaking of the injuries, you know, the the way that the um, uh, the emergency room report said it, you know, after I arrived by helicopter was eyes, nose, forehead anatomy, unrecognizable. Patient arrived at the ER in a condition incompatible with life. Mm. Yeah. Incompatible with life. That sounds like such a sterile medical term. Yeah. But like a nice way of saying this guy should be dead. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. So I was put into a, uh, you know, I went through an initial surgery there that night that was about 13 hours long of, uh, you know, just cleaning out bare saliva, debris, dirt, sticks from many, many wounds, um, essentially had been more or less like lots of uh, scalped is probably not an unfair word to use, like lots of large sort of flapping wounds and where skin had been pulled back. Um, every single bone in my head had been broken apart into many pieces and in some cases pulverized from from where the bear had chewed. Even the palate, you know, that holds the brain up into place had been broken apart into pieces. And so uh, the brain had actually herniated down into my sinus cavity and the dura, like this, the layer that holds the cerebral spinal fluid in and around the brain had been ripped open in three places. And so my brain was literally exposed to the outer world. And, uh, you know, just thinking about all of that, I mean, that means that the bear in three different spots came within millimeters of the brain. It, it The fact that I was alive is... To say that it's a miracle is kind of an understatement. I mean, it, it was it was impossible. And so, you know, and it's interesting. I've talked, I've spent a lot of time talking with this, with that surgeon who worked on me that first night, and he actually ended up working on me several other times. And 
he said that after that initial surgery, that 13 hour surgery, that he, he went back to his office and he closed the door and, and he cried. And this is a fa- this is a, a guy who works, sp- does surgery specifically with facial trauma. So he said it's, it wasn't that he'd never seen anything this severe or anything like that. It wasn't the injuries or anything like that. He, what, it, what it was for him was to, was to see somebody at 25 years old who was sort of at the prime of their life and to see this sort of devastating in, injuries, um, these sort of devastating injuries that he couldn't help but wonder, you know, what kind of life was I going to have? And he couldn't help but wonder if I would thank him for say, helping to save my life, if indeed he, he, he would save my life. So at the end of that, they couldn't begin any reconstruction or anything like that. So they essentially put me into a medically induced coma where they tried to stabilize me for the the next 11 days so that the swelling could start to go down enough to where they could start to try to put me back together again. And because there was so much, so many wounds and, and so many foreign you know, the saliva, their saliva and the, all the debris that, that they tried their best to clean out because there was so much sort of introduced into the, those wounds, like the risk of infection at that point was extraordinarily high as well. And so that was sort of then, even if I survived the initial trauma to try to navigate and skate by without a lethal infection was sort of the other significant challenge at that point in time. So I'll never forget, you know, like I, I woke up, you know, 11 days later from that medically induced coma and my head's all wrapped with bandages at that point in time. My jaw's wired shut. I have a tracheotomy that I'm getting oxygen through in my throat, and a feeding tube coming out of my stomach and IVs coming out of, you know, my arms and just trying to figure out what all happened, um, trying to figure out what my life was going to be. It was a terrifying time. And as I'm sitting there thinking about all this stuff, just kind of out of nowhere, I just thought, oh, what about Amber? Where's Amber? That cute strawberry blonde that I had just said goodbye to the morning before the bear. And I, of course, I couldn't speak at the time. And, you know, with the mouth wired shut and the tracheotomy and all this. And so... I was able to write down uh, to my family members, you know, where's Amber? And so they uh, they got a hold of her through some friends, you know. They, of course, my she was so new. We had just decided to try a relationship the day before, so uh, the bear. So uh, my none of my family really knew her, or knew who she was, or even knew of her. But uh, fortunately, you know, they were able to find her and. Uh, and so I'm sure for Amber, you know, she, the way she tells the story, it's sort of like she wanted to be there, but it was all she was going through her own process of like, well, who are we? Like, what do we have? Like, we we sort of officially dated for 12 hours before this happened to you, you know. Um, this is a, a uniquely awkward situation for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So for her to come in and sort of meet my my mom and my brother and yeah uh, after one one maybe two dates type of thing yeah awkward to say the least but so she questioned you know should i go but she did the only thing she could think to do which was to come down and you know she uh, comes into the hospital room and kneels down on the floor you know beside me and puts her arm up on my knee and I just remember thinking, like, what do you say to somebody in in a moment like this? And, you know, there's nothing to say. And so I just took my whiteboard that I was writing on to communicate at the time. And the first thing I wrote down was just one word. I just wrote crazy. And she's like, yeah, this is really crazy. And then I felt like I had to get the elephant out of the room because I just had been informed, you know, by the medical staff, the doctors the previous day. So I wrote down, I'm blind. And she says, yeah, I know. And I'm 
I'm really sorry about that. And I wrote down, you know, the only other thing that I could think to write at that time, which was, I'm scared. Because I was just like, man, if I survive all this, like if, if I make it through, you know, what kind of life am I going to be able to have? And lots, lots of fears about what that'd be like, you know? It would take so much to process. That, I mean, it, your entire life completely turned upside down. N- not even knowing if you were going to survive. But just to lay there and, I mean, you and, and you had all day and all night to think about just that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot to think about, you know. And, and it was interesting because when the doctors told me that I would never see again and that they were going to have to remove, you know, that one of my eyes had already been removed during the initial surgery because it was not viable. And and now the, the tissue was uh, starting to, to go on the second eye. And so they were going to have to remove that one. It, it made survival, yeah, like a whole nother unknown thing of like, yeah, well, what's that going to be like um, if, if, if that happened, if I survive type of thing. And I was thinking back, you know, to like, oh, yeah, I, I guess I couldn't see when I was at the river, but I never really thought about that in the midst of all that trauma. I just figured the trauma or too much blood or then, you know, I didn't take long before my head was all wrapped up with T-shirts and then bandages. And so there was a lot of denial when they first told me, you know, I, I, it was interesting They when they told me that I couldn't see or that I would never be able to see yeah, my first thing was like, well, that's not true. If, if if I can't see, how come I can see right now? And so there's this interesting thing called phantom vision where, and, and, you know, I was all looped up on all kinds of medications as well. And I wasn't exactly clear minded. And yeah, it took me a while to wrap my brain around that one. And, you know, I, I like to joke, now you know that i was the first blind person i ever met (laughs) (laughs) so i just had no idea what life for a blind person could be like you know so even as i did start to think about what that would be like i was like well first of all my all my love and passion for climbing and and mountaineering and backcountry skiing and, and backpacking and whitewater kayaking and mountain biking i mean you know that's all gone was my first thought and then i was just like man what else is gone like my ability to find meaningful work maybe like i was afraid of just being shuffled into medial work that wasn't meaningful or fulfilling i was afraid of never being an eligible sort of bachelor if you will like i was afraid of spending the rest of my life alone and without love in, in my life and never experiencing family and kids And so there was a lot that I was kind of grappling with uh, at that time. It wasn't until a few days after that, after Amber was there, that something totally unlikely happened. This guy named Lee Hagmeyer, who lived down in Juneau, he heard what happened to me and he got on an airplane and flew to Anchorage and walked into my hospital room and he introduced himself and he told me a story, his story, about how when he was 16 years old, 40 years earlier or something, how he'd been out fishing down in Juneau and, and was mauled by a grizzly bear. And he told me that for that 40 year period since then, that he was the only person that he knew of who had ever been completely blinded by a bear who lived to tell about it. And so he says to me, he says, Dan, you and me, we're, we're a tribe of two. <laughs> Not a club you want to join. It's an exclusive club, but <laughs> but not one you want to really join. But the point of the story, though, is that he went on to tell me about how since then, you know, he finished high school and he uh, went on and finished college and he'd gone on and gotten his Ph.D. and about how he had had a fulfilling career uh with the the division of vocational rehabilitation and 
how he had traveled the world and gotten married. And he eventually ended up telling me that he still goes fishing and and still owns a boat. And I was like, huh, okay, maybe there's hope, right? Like maybe there's hope that life isn't over, even if I live. Maybe there's hope that there could be a life worth living. And so that was a real important sort of turning point in the story for me where I wasn't quite so hopeless, you know, there was, there was hope about the possibility of, of a life worth living if I could get through all this. What, what an incredible thing for him to do. I mean, almost nobody else in the world, very few people would have realized what thoughts were going through your head that first day or week after it happened. But he had been through that and he knew what you yeah. were thinking. And uh, right. boy, what a what an incredible act of kindness for him to come and just want to just, give you hope that there is life. Yeah, totally. 100% amazing. So, so yeah, so day at a time, you know, medical stuff was sort of ups and downs, some scares. At one point in time, like my temperature started to spike and they were like, oh boy, here comes the infections. I ended up getting MRSA. You know, there was there was a couple scares, but with some ups and downs. And unfortunately, you know, five out of six arteries that carry blood to the scalp had been either lacerated kind of beyond the point of repair or just totally severed. And so there wasn't enough blood flow to my scalp. Uh, bone kept dying up there or in my skull from where they, had, you know, eventually had tried to sort of start to reassemble the sort of bits and pieces using titanium mesh scaffolding and screws and trying to rebuild the eye sockets and all this stuff. And, you know, they just couldn't, there wasn't enough blood flow that the, 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 the you know, skin kept reopening, wounds kept reopening and, and bones continued to kind of die. And so eventually it became clear that I was going to need uh, more advanced surgery than what could be offered in Alaska. And so they ultimately made the decision that I needed to fly out to uh, UCSF in San Francisco for some more advanced surgeries down there, where essentially the plan was they were going to take a graph of skin from my arm, um, but they were going to leave that graph of skin attached to the vascular system. So it's called a free flap surgery. They're taking that skin off my arm attached to the vascular system and and including the radial artery. So they were actually going to remove this flap of skin attached to the radial artery. And they were going to tie that radial artery into my carotid artery. And then that would then bring blood through the vascular system of that flap of skin up to what now is my forehead, you know, but it's up to the upper part of my head. So it's going to bring that much needed sort of blood supply. Because before, without that, you know, yeah, like I said, then they would close wounds, they'd just open right back up. And so it was still very much not out of the woods yet. So I decided, you know, my family is actually from California anyway, and uh, it was clear I was going to need to be down there for quite a while going through surgery and, you know, rehabilitation. And, and I thought, well, maybe I would just stay down there for a while for family support, what, you know, while I'm going through all this. So time came to where it was uh, time to say goodbye to Amber. You know, something that was on my mind and I was thinking about was just like, I'm in no shape to be in a new relationship, right? And she's like, you know, I, I none less than anybody wouldn't blame her for walking away from this. Uh, it was a sort of what I expected in my mind was like, well, we're not going to be together at this point. And, and so we, we, we sort of, before I left, you know, had a bit of conversation about that. And, and basically I was just like, yeah, you know, this is just, isn't the time. So uh, we gave our hugs and said our goodbyes and, you know, I'm sure we were going to be friends or was hoping, thinking we would be friends, but off I went to California, you know, but it was good because after kind of getting through some of the surgeries and stuff down there. And, and, and I think she had been, you know, keeping in touch with my, my, my family who was keeping her filled in on my progress and stuff. 
after a while we started talking on the phone um, and that was good and and just kind of touching basis and and then I'll uh, I'll never forget this one day when my brother had just been up to Alaska, you know, um, visiting up here. And he came back to California and he tells me, hey, Dan, I just thought you should know that it seems like Amber might be dating somebody. And uh, on the outside, I was like, oh, OK, cool, man. You know, thanks. But on the inside, it was more like, ouch, uh, it kind of hurt and, and, and almost more so than I expected, uh, caught me off guard a little bit. And so I, uh, I guess I, I'd say that I played my best card, uh, for, for that moment and almost compulsively, like right then and there sort of went and, and made the phone call and called Amber and was just like, Hey, Hey, I just want to let you know, uh, that I heard from my brother that it seems like you might be dating somebody. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that I think that's totally cool. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's a good thing that, uh, Amber has always been able to see kind of right through everything I say or think, uh, or feel because she says back to me, she's like, yeah, no, I am. And he's already getting really sick of how much I talk about you. <laughs> 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 that's not the best thing you could have heard right the best thing and so that's exactly it and so in that moment you know now my heart, I don't, now i'm excited like I, this is another one of those points in the story where i was filled with that feeling of hope and i think hope is is such an important thing for for anybody trying to overcome something anything but certainly anything of this magnitude, you know, you're facing these kinds of challenges to have, to have that excitement, that sense of hope was inc incredibly motivating and, and inspiring. And so, you know, we started, we kept talking on the phone. If, if I'd say more so even after that. And, uh, you know, I was determined and I became determined because to me, I would, there was hope that maybe, maybe there was something there with Amber still. And so I needed to get through the medical stuff. I needed to deal with my mental health issues because I was, you know, definitely dealing with a lot of PTSD, nightmares, panic attacks, obviously lots of grief and loss around losing my sight and everything that came with it. I mean, the very experience of, of going through this and, and losing my sight in, in an instant I very much think of it like a death rebirth experience where it's like, I lost my old identity, all the things I used to do and love my, I lost my old self. It's like that person died. And now there's this new Dan Bigley with this new possibility of a life ahead. And, and I kind of need to refigure this all out. Like, who am I? What am I capable of? What can I do with my life? What am I going to enjoy in life? So it's, it's this like rediscovery of self and of, of life. And part of that, I was pretty determined that if this thing with Amber had hope, that it couldn't be out of any sense of responsibility to me, that it couldn't be out of sympathy or feeling bad for me, that it couldn't be because she felt like I needed help, you know? You wanted to be a boyfriend, not a project, right? Yeah. Like if this was going to work, it, it had to be based on my own merits as a partner. And so it, it became about what do I have, you know, what value can I add to her life and to this relationship? What value can I add in general? And, and how do I get there from here? Um, because I was in, you know, I couldn't even make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to save my life back then, you know? <laughs> Couldn't, couldn't find my way, you know, uh, out to the mailbox and back or whatever, you know. And so I had a lot of a, a lot of work ahead of me. And so, you know, I started working with a rehabilitation specialist down there and learning how to use a, a, a white cane. Ultimately, once I was sort of medically cleared, which did end up you know, coming to fruition, then I, you know, I was asked my therapist, hey, can we meet twice a week instead of once a week? And so I was doing EMDR like this pretty good treatment protocol for working with people who have experienced traumatic events to help people that might be suffering from PTSD or traumatic responses. And 
ultimately then I ended up going to a school for the blind down there and it was supposed to be a year long program. And I'm thinking about Amber up in Alaska and I'm like, I need to finish this more quickly than that. Like how quickly can I do this? And and so, you know, I just poured myself into all of these things and uh, was able to finish up program at the school for the blind in, in just seven months. And so there I learned how to like do things, right? The activities of daily living. So I was learning how to cook and clean and use computers for the, the with software for the blind. And I was like to joke that I was learning how to match socks, you know, <laughs> um, and, and things like that. So it was about a year later when I made my first trip back up to Alaska since the bear. And at this point in time, Amber was no longer dating anybody. So she picks me up at the airport and we're driving back up to her cabin. Ironically, her little cabin up in Bear Valley. And once again, we sort of have this, like, I'm, I'm very, it's just an amazing, miraculous, special evening where it's clear to both of us that the, that chemistry that was there, that beluga chemistry or whatever you want to call it, it was still very much there between us. And so once again, come morning time, you know, it was clear to both of us that we were going to try this relationship thing. And the horrible irony of it, man, I can't even make this up, is that I had I had made plans previously to go fishing that very next morning. And so I kid you not, I literally, you know, had to go through that process of giving Amber a hug. Hey, I'll call you when I get off the river. And off I go to go fishing again. It was like, Groundhog's Day, right? It's like, we're going to give this another shot. But fortunately, obviously, that was a promise I was able to keep. And even better than that, when I called her uh, after getting off the river, I was able to tell her I just caught a 40-pound king salmon. (laughs) (laughs) So... I now like, you know, think back to that first trip back to Alaska as my as my victory lap, Uh, you know, one where I go, I I returned to Alaska, got the fish. And most importantly, I got the girl, you know, (laughs) (laughs) that's a great way to end that story for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When you're going through this type of recovery process this type of rehabilitation process there there comes a point to where like initially you know it's just straight up medical everything that went on for months i think i was finally so this happened in july i was finally sort of medically cleared by the following january and so then it was like yeah mental health and rehabilitation for the blind and learning all that stuff and and then there comes a point to where you're like okay like i can't just stay in this rehabilitation mode forever and ultimately things are going to be expected of me like paying bills and you know moving on with life and so that's a, a really interesting and difficult time and i was trying to figure out as a blind person you know what am I going to do with myself in my life? I I really liked the work that I was doing before I was blind with kids, you know, with kids that were troubled kids. They, these are kids that had experienced lots of trauma of their own. And so I knew I couldn't keep doing that. It was kind of rec therapy oriented, uh, very much acquired driving abilities and getting out with kids and doing things. So, but I, thought, especially after my own sort of therapy experiences, I thought, now that's something that I could do with this population, you know, and I like the work and I could do, I could do that. And so I looked into going back to, to college, um, as my first step. And so I, I was pleased to see that there was a master's of social work program here in Anchorage where I could be close to Amber and I filled out an application and I got, I'll never forget the day I got back my acceptance letter that said that I've been accepted into the Master's of Social Work program at the University of Alaska Anchorage. But my acceptance was contingent upon getting a B or better in statistics. And there was another, you know, prerequisite or whatever, but 
This one really stood out to me because I'm thinking about statistics, you know, and I'm like, man, you know, these, these are some really long equations and there's charts and graphs and curves. I was like, it seems very visual in nature. Like, how am I going to pull that off? And so, like so many other things, though, as a, as a blind person, you know, I, with anything I did, I didn't know if I could do it until I tried, right? And then even if I failed, you know, you kind of keep failing until you figure out how to do something. And, and so to me, in my mind, like, I'd never been a blind student. I didn't know if I could be successful as a blind student, but I was going to find out. And so I... uh started, you know, in the weeks leading up to the first day of school by taking public transportation to the the bus stop outside the university, first with an orientation mobility instructor and practicing routes around the campus, learning the routes with my cane, navigating the, the corridors and all of this stuff. I was practicing the routes to the specific classrooms that had been assigned without my instructor every single day leading up to the first day of class. I walk in to class on the first day of school, you know, only to find out that they had reassigned all the classrooms. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, I, you know, many times in my life as a blind person, I'm humbled and had to learn to be graceful about asking for help and to just accept that as reality. So I asked for some help and they helped me find my new classrooms or whatever. And I'm sitting there in statistics class and the teacher's up in the front of the classroom and she's teaching on the overhead projector and I'm trying to follow it all. And I'm just not able to, to learn that way. And so rather than learning statistics, what I'm doing is I'm sitting in statistics class, having pretty massive panic attacks. It feels like my heart's pounding so hard that other people could probably see my t-shirt moving. You know, my stomach's all queasy and, and a little bit nauseous. My arms and legs are numb and kind of feel like noodles Everything is a little surreal and, and unreality. I, I feel like I'm inside of like a glass bubble and I'm kind of getting information from outside of it in bits and pieces. And I feel like I'm going to pass out. And so the narrative in my head during st stats class was essentially like, OK, I'm going to pass out. Maybe I should get up and leave the classroom and go to the bathroom. And I'm like, well, no, because if I pass out there, you know, I might hit my head on something and that could be bad. So I'm probably better off just passing out here if that's really going to happen. <laughs> and in moments like that, in those early days, like where I was really struggling, the only thing I wanted to do was to, to get up and, and leave class, just walk right out and walk back to the bus stop and, and, go home and just crawl into bed and just say, you know what? I can't do it. I can't do it. Like, it's too hard. I give up. I'm just going to figure out something else. And I oftentimes talk about how I didn't get here to where I am today by being some sort of like survivor or somebody who overcame all the odds on their own. Like, no, I, I very much got to where I am today because of a community of support, um, not because of my independence, but because of my interdependence with the people around me. And that they were able to kind of support me through some of those hardest times. And so, like, in that moment where things were that hard, like, I couldn't give up on on all the people who believed in me. I couldn't give up on all those people who had said, hey, Dan, if anybody can do this, you can do it. I couldn't give up on Lee Hagmeyer, you know, who had told me about his story. I couldn't imagine facing my parents and my brother and, and telling them, you know, I couldn't do it. And most of all, of course, you know, I couldn't imagine telling Amber that I couldn't do it. And so it was all those relationships and those people that really lifted me and carried me through those moments where you know, I was determined to find a way. And so I first got a tutor. And when one tutor wasn't enough, I got a second tutor. And when two tutors wasn't enough, I literally got myself a third tutor. And Amber was working with me a little bit on the evenings and weekends when she wasn't working. And 
by about, you know, maybe a third of the way through the semester, you know, I was kind of figuring out how to, to be successful in statistics class. I was, you know, using this talking like a computer with screen reading software where, where I could use a computer and it would read to me what was on the screen and I could uh, work through. And then I had a, uh, a voice recorder where I would record the long statistical equations, not in their given order, but in the order of operations to make it easier to track the work. So then I was writing that into the computer and and showing my work sort of step by step. And then I had a talking calculator uh, that I was using to perform actual arithmetic, I was learning how to use software packages to, to manufacture and create charts and graphs and curves and, and, the, and this histograms and this kind of thing. And so, you know, I was doing it. And by the end of that semester, like I'll never forget, it was sort of, you know, Christmas break and Amber and I are on pins and needles waiting for for the grades to post to see if I had gotten a B or better in statistics because sort of my future plans were on the line here. And I'll never forget when it posted, like just the feelings because... I had somehow pulled off an A in statistics. In that moment, you know, this is another one of those moments in the story, and and not just the story, but in my life where the, the narratives about myself change. You know, I often think about and have heard from others about how our greatest limiting factor in life is the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. That's our most limiting factor. And in in this moment, the story sort of changed from like, I don't know what I can do, but I'll try. And that sort of changed to, I think I can do just about anything that I put my mind to. And so sure enough, I, I graduated three and a half years later with the 4.0 and a master's in social work. I went on to get a job as a therapist, helping kids with their own trauma, and very quickly started getting promoted, first director of therapeutic foster care program, and now I'm the clinical director at Denali Family Services here in Anchorage. So I oversee oh, about 15 therapists at three different clinics and oversee care for about 200 kids at any given time in our services. And I've uh, gone on to write a book about my experiences called Beyond the Bear, uh, How I Learned to Live and Love Again After Being Blinded by a Bear, and I share my story as a, a speaker across the country to all different kinds of, of audiences. I you know, just recently uh, dropped my first album as, as a musician, just as kind of my, my passion project. And so the best thing, though, that's ever that's happened to me since then, like the, the kicker of it all, the the cherry on top, if you will, is that... Amber and I, this this next summer, you know, we'll be celebrating 15 years of marriage, and we have a 11 year old daughter and a 13 year old son that are just wonderful kids. They, they mean everything to me, you know. And sometimes I remember this story, and I share this story about how when she was about two and a half or something, she wasn't yet three. Uh, I was tucking her into bed at night. And we were kind of having this moment together you know and it, at first I, I mean i was just kind of with her you know you putting your kids to bed and you're just kind of like with them so i think i might have even been like on my phone or something and she's like hey dad are you blind and i said <laughs> i kind of put my phone down look at her like yeah you know uh i'm blind i'm blind and she's like, she, and you, she just stops and she could tell, like, I could tell that she was thinking about it, that and her wheels are turning, you know, and so I'm just waiting for her to respond. And she, she says, are you happy? And I said, yeah, dad's really happy. I mean, so she, I could tell she was thinking about that, you know, she was taking that in. She's just quiet. And I'm just waiting for her to say something. And she says, so you're blind and you're happy. <laughs> uh, what do you say? You know, I was like, yeah, dad's blind and happy. It was like one of the happiest moments of my life right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, spending that moment with her as she's figuring this out. Pretty amazing. So kind of what I've learned, you know, through all this, just in terms of 
first off, I've learned the, that, that the importance of that interdependence, right? That our strength is, is not our independence, but our interdependence. That it really did take a community to help me get to where I am. And so I'm grateful that I was really kind to people and nice people and did things to build a community around me because I think, you know, I lived by my values and I told the truth and I worked hard because I think when you live your life a certain way, you, you build that community or, or you degrade that community and, and that community really, it builds our resiliency. So that in kind of retrospect, like looking back on that, I'm grateful for that community that was there for me and and grateful that I live my life in such a way that builds that community. And and I think about that. And, and that's a lot of the work that I do now in communities more generally, in schools that I might speak, spend time with, speaking with, or even in, in the lives of my clients is really looking at that in terms of how do we build more resiliency within our communities to, to really help support people, even in organizations and workplaces, right? Like how do we build resiliency into a business um, and into the lives of our employees through that business, through the, the culture of, of, a, of an organization. But I'd say for me, the biggest thing, you know, is that I, I've realized that, and I, I'm going to talk about this obviously from my own perspective as blindness, but I think we could fill in just about any other type of disability, any other type of disabling anxiety or stressor or even this life event, whether it's a divorce or a loss of a job or whatever, it, for me, like it's about my disability. And I've, I've learned that there's this inverse and proportional relationship between engaging in life and disability. And that is to say that the more you engage in life, regardless what your circumstances are, regardless of anything, the more you're engaged, the less disabled you are. But the more you disengage, so the less engaged you are, the more disabled you become. If you look at the blind community as an example of that, like there are blind people out there who experience the same condition of total blindness. And it's clear and easy to see that they're very disabled by that condition. You know, the unemployment rate within the blind population, something like 80%. And yet at the same time, there's blind people who are like lawyers and doctors and social workers and artists and dancers. And, you know, it's easy to look, you know, there was a blind person that climbed Mount Everest. And so it's easy to look at some people and say, with the same exact condition of total blindness, they're engaged in life in such a way that they don't appear to be disabled at all. They're doing more with their lives than most people with sight. And so there, it, it is that, you know, regardless what your condition is, whether it's mental health or you know, some life circumstance or some physical disability that the more you can be engaged in life, the less disabled you are. And so, you know, in running with that, the more I've engaged in life, and it, whether it's you know, writing a book or making an album or even just things like playing um, guitar and howling at the moon with my friends or playing hide and go seek with my kids, um, that the more I engage in life, the bigger my life gets. And that the bigger my life gets, the smaller my disability gets. That's an excellent way to look at it. Yeah. Well, I can see why you are popular with uh, speaking to groups. Of course, right now, we're as we record this, we're, our country's in the middle of a raging pandemic. So I would imagine you're probably not traveling a lot and speaking in person. But, of course, that will happen again as well, I'm sure. But you have a lot of contact information. You're on Facebook and uh, you've got your website. Yeah, those, those are the best ways to reach me. Yeah, it's uh, yep, yeah, Dan Bigley, um, Bear Attack Survivor on Facebook or on my website, dan at danbigley.com or beyondthebear.com. You can also go check out my new album, which uh, we're going to be launching here in very shortly. Probably by the time your listeners are, are getting this, it will be available on all the major streaming sites. Um, you know, available for streaming and, and download on anywhere you can find music. So we'll have links to all that in the show notes for this episode. And I got to tell you, I read the book and you know this, we've talked about it. I read the book prior to our conversation, just so that I could be aware of what happened and everything. And it was, it's a very well written book. I mean, typically you, you think of someone that goes through an event like this and they, you know, they come through the other side and, they decide, okay, I now want to write a book about this. And they're not really a writer, but this is a book that is 
I mean, I would recommend this book definitely. And uh, I, I highly recommend people to read it. It goes into a lot more of the details than what we can do here on a podcast. And there's a, there was a lot more involved than, than what we went over here. But it's, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. That's great. Well, yeah, thanks. And people can find uh, Beyond the Bear is the name of the book. And it can be found yeah, just about anywhere as well. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. For a story that has such a horrific plot, for it to end as well as it has. That's, it's wonderful. People sometimes say like, oh man, you know, I'm so sorry, like for what you went through or whatever. And it's funny because my attitude is exactly the opposite. I mean, I understand why people say that, but for me, it's like, man, I'm the luckiest guy alive because <laughs> I'm so lucky to be alive. I'm so lucky that, you know, this is where I ended up with so much to be grateful for. Hey, you heard Dan say he's a musician, right? Well, in a minute, we're going to hear some of his music, so hang on for that. But I have a couple of things I want to tell you about. If you haven't yet joined our private Facebook group, get over there now. We talk about the podcast episodes and lots of other stuff, and we've got over 800 listeners in that group. And you can join at whatwasthatlike.com slash Facebook. And I wanted to let you know, there are now nine raw audio episodes available to listen to. The raw audio episodes are bonus episodes for patrons who support the show for $5 a month. In this new episode, which is Raw Audio 9, a man tries to keep his wife alive after he shoots her. Oh my God. Oh my God, she just died. She just died. Oh, my God. Okay. Are you able to do CPR? A young woman is trapped in her car after a crash. It's okay. Just stay calm. (laughs) I'm just going to be... It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And a teenager witnesses a murder-suicide. Where are the weapons at? The The gun gun is, the axe is in Jake's head and the gun is in Brian's hand. These are actual 911 calls with the stories that go with them. You can get all of them by supporting the podcast at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. And I know how you love to learn about other podcasts. Here's one that I recently discovered called Three Spooked Girls. Check it out. Hey there, I'm Tara. And I'm Jessica. And together we co-host the podcast Three Spooked Girls. If you love the paranormal or murder, join us on Mondays for full-length episodes where we discuss our favorite paranormal stories and true crime cases. And join us again on Thursdays for our mini-sodes called Stabby Snippets, where we tell you all about true crimes happening in the news. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, wherever the hell else you listen to your pods at. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, by using the handle at Three Spooked Girls. Come and hang out with us and get your spooky on while we scare the hell out of you. The Three Spooked Girls. And to play us out for this episode, here's a clip from Dan Bigley performing his song, Comatose Rider. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.